you're glad to be in church this morning, say amen. amen. All right, turn the lights on so you can see I am not Matt Burrell. If you haven't figured that out already, the hair is a little different among some other differences, but I am not he. He's out of town today. Thank you so much. Why don't you take a minute and look around the church. These are the poor people. Y'all were too broke to go out of town, and so church was the other option. Thank you so much for being here today. This is Memorial Day, and we are celebrating the fact that many have died to give us the freedoms that we enjoy. We've been so free for so long, we take it for granted. We forget that great sacrifices have been made. And we should never forget those things. Of course, there's another sacrifice that was made to give us a freedom that transcends all freedoms, and that's the death of Jesus Christ. And that's why we're here this morning worshiping together. But don't forget, as you celebrate, whatever you do this weekend, whether you're cooking out, you're going somewhere, having a good time with your family, that all of this was purchased because someone else sacrificed. Take a few minutes to remember those things today. When I was a little boy growing up, I was in a poor family. I didn't realize how poor we were until I got older. I'm not talking about dirt floor chickens running around, that kind of poor. Not West Virginia poor. If you're West Virginia, from West Virginia, I'm sorry, but not that bad. But we did grow up poor. In fact, every time we would get in the car, our car was always on empty. You know what I'm talking about? In fact, we would judge whether or not we could travel by how close the line was on the E. If it was just touching the top of the E, we were fine. We had plenty of gas. If it was halfway on the E, we needed to be careful. If it was all the way on the E, we'd pull in and put in $3 worth. Y'all know, know what I'm talking about? Anybody in here ever stopped at the gas station and put in $3 worth of gas? Y'all are my kind of people. Absolutely. Running our whole life uh, on empty, just trying to make it. Well, this family that we're going to be talking about this morning spent their wedding celebration running on empty. And I want you to read this passage. It's a story you all are familiar with, but I want to show you some things that God's teaching me. I preached out of this 15 times, and every time I go to it, God shows me something I have never seen before. And I want to present it to you kind of as an allegory, a metaphor about real life. Let's read the passage first of all. John chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto them, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone. After the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. I know you don't know what a firkin is, but we're going to get to that, all right? Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Now before I get started in the text, I want to just point something out. I'm probably going to offend some of you, and I don't mean to, but I'm trying to be faithful to the text. All right. The first miracle that Jesus does is not at church. It's not in a deacon's meeting. It's not at Sunday school, all right? The first thing that Jesus does is he does a miracle at a wedding celebration. Can I use a word we don't like to use at church? Jesus and his disciples were at a party. They were at a party, and they were drinking wine. So, Brother Dusty, I believe that's grape juice. That's fine. You can believe it's grape juice if you want to. I don't care what you believe in regards to that. But whatever it was they were drinking, if they didn't have it, the party was over. You agree with me on that? If grape juice does that for you, more power to you. Go home and get some, all right? Just here to tell you, because I am tired of we Christians coming into church with a sour expression on our face, like we have a bad case of Christian seriousness, that we think that the holier we are, the grouchier we are, the more cantankerous we become. The more angry we spend our lives. When we're the only ones in the world who have a right to be happy and enjoy anything because our God is on the throne and he's king of kings and lord of lords. So however you want to interpret it, just get this. In the Bible, wine is a picture of joy. 
Water is a picture of the routine, the everyday, when you don't have joy. And I want to give you this as an allegory and show you these things as in a metaphoric sense that when we run out of wine, we end up with just water in the absence of joy in our life. And Jesus is at this party, and his mother comes to him and tells him, they have run out of wine. Now, evidently, his mother and my wife have some similarities. She didn't ask him to do anything. She just said, they're out of wine. How many times have I been sitting on the couch doing something, and Anna will say, I left my purse in the car. <laughs> oh, let me just go right out there and get that for you. I know what you meant. That's how Jesus was approached by his mother. And I want you to understand that there is a little secret about life that we don't always tell our kids, and it's this, that whatever you're enjoying in life, the wine always, eventually, runs out. It always does. You think, if I just get this job, my life would be transformed, everything would be perfect. And you get that job, and for a while you're excited, and then after a bit, it's just the routine. You think, oh, if I just marry this person, oh, my, oh, I'm, I'm marrying above my pay grade. I, this is it. My life will be. And, and then you realize they're human, and they got all kinds of problems, and the beauty declines, and all of those things that go with it, and you're stuck right here just existing. Do you remember that time when you first got saved and you met Jesus Christ? How excited you were about the gospel? Want we'll to tell the world about Jesus? Woo! Y'all remember that? Now it's a struggle to get you to come here for the 11 o'clock service. You make it to work at 7 o'clock, no problem, but 11 seems so early in the morning as you drag yourself in here, sit down, and look at me and scowl at me while I'm preaching and then wonder why. Man, he didn't just have it today. Yeah. We get there. The wine is gone out and we're left with a routine. Sometimes we enjoy the benefit of good health all of our life, and then some sickness, some disease comes into our life, and we find ourselves robbed of that good health. The joy of living is gone, and we find ourselves sitting over here thinking that what used to be so wonderful, what used to be so much a part of our life, is now just emptiness and struggle and difficulty. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you all experienced life when the wine runs out? It always does run out. You know what I'm talking about. How many of you at Christmas time spend $1 billion on your children? <laughs> Y'all know what I mean. Yeah, pile stuff all around the tree, making their life fulfilled and complete. You know it'll just be wonderful. And they open up all those presents. Fast forward six months later, you're having a yard sale out in your yard, selling the stuff that you bought for them because it no longer satisfies them. You take them into Walmart, show them a new toy, and they act like they never got nothing in their life and pitch a fit because you won't buy it for them. Was that just my kids? No, no. Yeah, it's all of us. Then fast forward 30 years and ain't nothing changed. Ain't nothing changed. We buy all kinds of things thinking it's going to be the answer. Fulfill our life. And we get it. And before long, we're selling that on the marketplace, looking for something else to satisfy our hearts because we understand that everything we purchase, everything we buy, every experience we have, eventually the wine runs out and we're left running on empty. What do you do when you find yourself like that? When you find yourself in that spot in life where there's just no joy anymore. There's no excitement. All that you live for is just routine, basic, elementary, dry. What do you do? I got three things to remind you of. The first is this. When you find yourself running on empty, take it to Jesus. Notice in John chapter 2, verse 3, And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. What did she do when the wine ran out? Talk to me. She went to Jesus. Now notice, Mary couldn't do anything for him. She never can, by the way. All right, But she can point you to the right place. Jesus is the one who can fix your problems. He is the answer to every problem. Please understand that. He is the answer. And if you don't believe that he's, why are you here? Because this is the group of people who do believe it. And if you don't believe it, please understand today, we have no hope outside of the person of Jesus Christ. He is our hope. Now, please understand this about wine or grape juice. Either one of them. 85% water. 85% water. So, if all wine is 85% water, then might we say that all water has the potential to be wine? Did y'all hear me? All water has the potential 
to be wine. What does it take? It only takes the touch of Jesus Christ to make the difference. And so whatever place you find yourself in life where the circumstances are dry and difficult and hard, the first thing you need to do is to get to Jesus Christ because all it takes is one touch of his hand and your situation to transform things forever and to turn your water into wine. That's what our God can do. Don't complain about where you are. Look and realize the potential of what you have if God would only put his finger on it. See, oftentimes God robs us of the joy of things that we might learn to find our joy in him alone. He makes it empty. He makes it dry. Not so we'll enjoy those things, but we'll enjoy the one who gave them to us. Not the gift, but the giver himself. He puts us in hardships so that we will learn to run to him with it because he's the only one who can fix the problem. Wherever you find yourself this morning, first thing I can tell you if you're running on empty is get to Jesus Christ. He's the one that can transform the hearts. Nowhere else is there hope. The second thing I want you to get is this. Now, I'm not a long-winded preacher. I started to say I'm not a short preacher, but I know how y'all take that. Y'all think I brought this bucket up here so I could stand on it. That's not why. I'll show you that just here in a few minutes. But I want you to get it. The second thing is this. Remember that there is a timing factor in life. Life is full of seasons. You go through a season where everything is going wonderful, you know what I'm talking about? Just keep on living, all right, because the pendulum will swing the other way, and after a while you find yourself in a downtime. Don't get discouraged. You're not about to die. It'll swing back a little bit later on, and you'll... You know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all must be seven years old because you never experienced these things, all right? This is just part of life. There are seasons that you go through in life where things just change. Do not make major life decisions in down, dry periods. Can I say that again? Do not make life-changing decisions in dry periods in your life. Uh, the first thing we do when we're struggling, well, I'm just going to quit going to church. I see people all the time in New York that I know have been delivered, and I'll say, hey, I ain't seen you in a while. Well, we're going through some hard things, but as soon as we get that worked out, we'll be back. It's like saying, as soon as I quit bleeding, I'm going to go to the hospital. <laughs> no, you, you go to church because you're in a dry place. You go to the hospital because you're bleeding. Sometimes we say, oh, my wife's not what she's supposed to be. I, I think I'll find me a new one. Oh, you're making a life-changing decision just because, didn't Matt just preach on that for like seven weeks in a row? Don't forget the camper that was up here, how quickly we set those things aside. Absolutely. And he reminds us, don't make big decisions. Don't make big decisions. Wait, because the season of life will change. Jesus says unto his mother, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. I intend to do something. It's just not time for me to do something. Now, please understand, in their culture, referring to his mother as woman does not mean what it means in our culture, all right? Because if I had done that to my mother, I wouldn't be here to talk to you today. You know what I'm talking about. But it was not, he was not being disrespectful. He was just pointing out this fact to her. I intend to do something. It's just not time for me to do something. And I want you to get that most of the time when we're over here in our struggle, in our dry place, we are tempted to do other things and find other ways to go. When in reality, if we just learn to be patient and wait on God, he is going to do something. It's just not his time to do something yet. What does the bridegroom, what, I mean, what does the governor of the feast say about the quality of the wine at the end of our story? What did he call it? The best wine. So if there's a best wine, then it stands to reason there is a less than the best wine, right? Some of y'all think y'all are drinking wine and it's really just Kool-Aid. And I mean that in every sense of the word, Kool-Aid. It's some concoction you've mixed up and you think that it's satisfying you, it's gonna give you what you want, and you post it all over social media, woo, look at me, ah, I'm drinking wine. No, you're not. It's just some empty thing that you've made for yourself. And you want us all to be convinced that your heart's just not as empty as it's ever been. And this new toy that you think you have that's going to give you that will rob you and leave you empty just like everything else does. Only God can give the joy. Notice this verse, passage of scripture for me, with me in Isaiah chapter 50. It says, Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, and walks in darkness and hath no light? Do you see that paradox? Normally, if a man fears the Lord and obeys God, he walks in light but this man's obeying God and walking in darkness and he doesn't have any light 
He's not talking about the darkness of sin. He's talking about the fact that he's walking in a place where he can't see his hand in front of his face. He don't know what's going on. He don't know how to make the right decisions. He's confused about his life. He's trying to do right. He's trying to fear God. He's trying to obey. And yet, he's just stuck. He don't know what to do. The Bible says, when you find yourself like that, read it with me. Let him, what's that next word? Trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. What does it mean when you trust God? It means that even though you don't understand, you believe that even when you can't see it, he's working. Even when you don't know it, he's working. You believe that God is accomplishing his purpose. And then it tells you to stay upon your God. What does stay mean? I say to my dog, stay. I say to my son, stay. He doesn't listen, but I say that to him. I say that to Aunt. No, I don't say that to Anna. <laughs> stay. Be still. God says, hey. Just wait. Trust me. Believe me. I'm doing something. You think you're just surrounded by water? Everything in your life is not where you wish it would be. You're grumbling and complaining because all you see is that routine, that difficulty. All the joy is taken out of it. You're just barely existing. You're running on empty. God said, I know that. I put you there on purpose so that you'll come to me and I'm fixing to do something. But I just need you to wait and trust God. Waiting on God is the most difficult lesson you will ever learn as a Christian. Just to believe him and wait. Take your hands off of it. We're so used to manipulating and creating and doing things to make things happen for our own benefit than learning to take our hands off of it and just be still. That's what God wants us to do. Now notice you have another option. If you're walking in darkness, behold all of you that kindle a fire, that compass or surround yourselves with sparks, Walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks that you have kindled. This you shall have on my hand, but you will lie down in sorrow. God said, you don't want to wait on me when you're in the darkness? Go ahead and light your own fire. Just get your little sparklers out and make your way. Do it your way. Drink your Kool-Aid. But when you lie down at night, your heart will be full of regret that you didn't wait on God. Is there anybody in this room that can say, Brother Dusty, I was in a place in my life where it was dry and difficult and barren, but I took it to Jesus, and in his perfect time, and he turned it around and gave me some joy out of that thing that I've never had before. Do you know what I'm talking about? God can do that, and he longs to do that. He puts you in that place on purpose so he could do that. But you've got to wait on him. You've got to believe him. You've got to have the confidence that he is going to do what he said he would do in his perfect timing. Now, number three. Number three. When you're running on empty, do what he told you to do last. Notice the verse. There were six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Now, a firkin is ten gallons. All right? So how big were these pots? Ten to twenty, twenty to thirty gallons. All right? Twenty to, we'll say twenty-five and split the difference. What were the pots made out of? It's right there. Stone, okay? So if Jesus tells me to fill up a, a stone pot that holds 25 to 30 gallons, I just pick this thing up, I take it over here to the faucet, turn it on. Is that how I fill it up? Can I pick up a stone pot that you don't have much confidence in my physique? Do I need to take my jacket off? No, it don't get any better if I do. All right. So I have six water pots a stone, each one holding 25 gallons, okay? How much is that total? 150 gallons, all right. So how am I going to fill this up? Well, I can't pick it up, which means i got to go get water. How much holds, how much fits in this bucket? Five-gallon bucket. How much can I carry in it? If you said five, you ain't never tried. <laughs> you go ahead and fill this up to the brim. When you'll come back, your leg will be all wet. You'll have about four gallons in it by the time you get back. But I'll give you five. If I need 150 gallons of water and I have a five-gallon bucket, how many trips to the water hose do I have to make? 30. Some of y'all are not good at math. 30. <laughs> but I don't have a water hose. It's the well. The well. Jesus said, Fill it up. 
Now, if I'm a servant of Jesus and Jesus tells me to do something, what do I do? All right, Jesus. One. Now, I don't know how far the well is, but I promise you it wasn't just right outside the door, all right? And I'm filling it up. I'm doing what Jesus told me to do, right? Aren't we all? Hallelujah. About number 20. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Did Jesus get his own water? <laughs> I don't even know who Jesus is because I ain't never met him. Some guy just comes up to me and says, fill it up. And here I am filling it up. I do not understand. I do not like it. I'm aggravated. This is my 20th trip to the well. Get his own water. I'm done with it. You know what I'm talking about? There it goes. Dramatic effect. <laughs> Tired of filling it up. 30 gallons. 30 trips, 150 gallons of water that he's asked me to do. And I'm working and I'm sweating and I'm not. To what? For what reason? Did they know he was going to turn water into wine? Neither do you. You don't know what he's going to do. You just better do what he told you to do because you don't know when he's going to touch it and transform that in an instant. And you'll be amazed and so grateful that you did what he told you to do when he told you to do it. Now notice how these servants worked. How did they fill it up? It's right there, y'all. Filled it up to the brim. Now, if there were six water pots of stone and you asked me to fill them up, eh, you'd get about 100 gallons because I ain't filling them to the brim. Well, these weren't those kind of guys. These are the kind of guys that said, hey, I'm working for Jesus. I'm going to do my very best. As long as he tells me to do it, I'm going to keep on doing it. I know it don't make any sense. I know he, I don't understand these things, but I'm just going to keep on doing it because he told me to do it. I, all I got is water, water, water everywhere. I want wine. But all I got is water, but this is what he told me to do, so I'm going to keep on doing it until he makes a difference in my life. That's the kind of person God's looking for. He said, hey, I know you want wine, but keep pulling the water like I told you to. Keep going to church. Keep reading your Bible. Keep witnessing. Keep giving. Keep doing the things I told you to do. Fill it up to the brim because you don't know when I'm going to reach down in a minute and turn that into wine, and everybody present will go, man, that's the best stuff I have ever had. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit just because life is dry, because life is difficult. Stop looking over the fence thinking the grass is greener. Stop thinking about some major change in your life. Keep doing the things God told you to do last. Uh, one of the reasons why most of us in this room don't have joy in our lives is because God told us to do something, and we said, I'm good. I'm good. I'll just sit here and enjoy the praise team. Preach to me. I'm going home. Be done with this in just a few more minutes. I'm done. And you won't obey. And if you don't obey him, you'll never have the water turned into wine. It'll always be dry. It'll always be empty. Because God just basically says to you, when you get ready to obey, let me know. I'm going to go over here. When you pick that bucket up and say, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life, but I'm going to obey. And you begin to fill that bucket because he told you to do it. You'll find that you can have a full life even when it's just water. Because you're obeying Jesus Christ. So let me show you one more thing about this. So after they filled it up to the brim, you can imagine those servants all sweaty, hot. Because nobody gets married when it's nice and cool. It's always like 9 billion degrees outside. You're sweating to death. You know how it is. You've been to weddings. <sighs> Jesus says, get a cup of that. Take it to the governor of the feast. Now, who was the governor? To the servants. He was their boss. Now, these water pots, what kind of water pots were they? Yeah, but it says something else. After the manner of the purifying of the Jews. What does purifying mean? Going to wash, all right? So if I'm going to a wedding, I'm going to wash. I'm going to wash my hands, first of all. Maintain six feet of distance and keep, no, you know what I'm talking about. All right, I'm going to wash my hands. But the Jews wash something else. What else do they wash? They wash feet because everybody wore flip-flops, sandals, Crocs, everywhere they went, all right? When they came in to go to a wedding, Walking down a dirty, dusty road, what happened to their feet? All brown and crusty, just like some of y'all's are right now. I, you, you hiding them, but I know it's bad. It's bad. 
And so they'd have a servant there, and his job was to wash the feet, to wash the hands, so that they could go into the wedding feast and not offend people. Now, let's just say you came to my house. Don't, by the way. Call first. Um, I'm teasing. All right, you say you came to my house, and I asked you, want something to drink? You said, yeah, I'd like some tea. I said, Anna, make him some tea. And Anna walked over to the dog bowl, got it up, dumped the water out of it, washed it out, put it up, put it on the stove, started it up, make you some tea. You would say, oh, Dusty. I don't, I'm good. I don't need any tea. I said, well, she, she washed it out. Yeah, but it's the designated dog bowl. And I would never dishonor you as a guest by feeding you something that we made in the dog bowl. And yet Jesus tells these servants, dip some water out of the pots for washing feet and take it to your boss and say, drink this. It's good. And the servants are going, if I do that, I'm going to lose my job. Because to them, what's in the pot? It's just water. It's water that they've been running back and forth 30 trips to the well to fill up. And it's foot washing water. And Jesus tells them to do something that does not make sense. Not only does not make sense, it contradicts everything going on in their head that they should not do it. And here he is telling them to do it. Now, when they dipped it out, what is it? Water. When they get to the governor and give it to him, what is it? Wine. Not just wine. <laughs> the best wine ever. When did it change? I don't know. I don't know. But here's what I do know. If you'll obey God, even when it doesn't make sense, somewhere in the middle of your obedience, God will turn that water into the very best wine that has ever existed. And when other people take a drink of it, they'll say, I cannot believe that. Where did that come from? And nobody will know. But you'll know. You know why you'll know? Because you'll remember all them nights of just obeying God. Even when you didn't want to obey God. Even when you did not understand. Even when you were lonely, tired, and frustrated. Yet because this was the last thing he told you to do. You're just going to keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. Because he told you to do it. And then when it doesn't even make sense. You're going to obey anyway. Because you trust him. Because you have waited for him. Because you have believed him. And when you hand it to him. Expecting to hear you've lost your job. Instead you hear. Where did this come from? Because I ain't never tasted anything like that. That is what God can do when you're running on empty. If you will just trust him and do what he told you to do. That's what he can do. Now, let me help you take it home this morning. The first thing is this. God is always working to use the water in your life to make future wine. What I mean by that is whatever experience you find yourself in, wherever you are this moment on Memorial Day weekend, mad because you don't have a boat to be on the lake, aggravated that you're too broke to go anywhere, mad because Pastor Matt's out of town, sitting here having to listen to Brother Dusty, here you are. Understand that God puts all of this water in your life because he plans on doing something down the road. He's bringing it here for future work. And if you'll keep doing what you're supposed to do in his perfect time, he will turn that water into wine. So don't be aggravated about where you're at. Don't stop complaining because it's not what you want it to be. See the value of what it could be when God puts his hand on it. He's going to do something. He already said he was. All things are working together for our good. Can we trust him long enough? Can we wait long enough for it, for him to do it? Well, if you believe him, he can. Or you can light your own fire, do your own thing, and reap the consequences of that. And I don't think we need to go around the room very long to get testimonies to that effect. Trust him. He's working for future wine. And the second thing is this. God always saves the best for last. He always saves the best for last. The most difficult spot you're in now is just the beginning of something great that God wants to do in the future. Now, the devil's just the opposite. I have the privilege of going and preaching sometimes at Crossroads Rescue Mission in Shelby, North Carolina. Whenever I talk to those guys about their addictions, I ask them sometimes, what's the highest high you ever had? And all of them always tell me the first time. The first time I got high was the best high I ever had. And it only went downhill from there. And every time I use, I'm trying to get to that 
but I can never experience it again. Because the devil gives the best at first. There's pleasure in sin for a season, and then all goes downhill. But God works just the opposite. He says, you're struggling now because it's going to get better in the future. It's going to get better until it gets best. And when it gets best is when we're standing before the throne of God, all of us surrounded here at Liberty Church with believers from all over the world, and we're raising our hands and praising God, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, and we worship Him forever as we live in a place with no more sickness, no sorrow, no death. Y'all have forgotten about this place that we plan on going to one day? That's the best. And God said, whatever you're going through, I'm preparing you for something else. And ultimately, I'm preparing you for the place you're going to live with me forever when there's no water. It's just wine, wine, wine all the time. That's what God wants to give us. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? So when you find yourself running on empty, what are you going to do? Are you going to seek some Kool-Aid toy to fix things temporarily? You're going to wait on God. Take it to Jesus. Keep doing what he told you to do. Trust him. That he knows what's best. Father, thank you for the privilege to preach this morning. God, you have blessed this church with a great man of God in Matt Burrell. I don't take it lightly to have the opportunity to stand up here this morning. But God, your people here know the struggles of life. We know the ups and the downs and the hardships. And so often we seek for something else besides you. We chase things that do not satisfy. We pursue things to our own destruction. And God, I'd ask that you would grant us the ability to understand that our only hope is found in you. And then when life becomes empty, pointless, we can't seem to find the way we ought to go. Give us the confidence that even when we can't see it, you're working. That you can fix things, you can do things that no one else can do. And give us the confidence and the purpose to wait on you, to obey you, even when it doesn't make sense, in anticipation of the day when you give us the best. We praise you for this possibility. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Pastor James. Thank you for being here at Liberty with us this morning. If you're a visitor, I just want to ask you again, if you took the time to fill out one of our connection cards, you can take it by our connection desk. We've got a free gift waiting for you over there. Uh, next Sunday, June the 6th, we'll be doing baptisms. If you haven't signed up for that yet, we'd like to be baptized with us here at Liberty. You can go online and sign up, or you can come see me at the connection desk, and I can get you on the list. It will be our last baptism service at Liberty until September. We've got some exciting changes in the process we go through for baptism that I'm really excited about and can't wait for you to see more about what we're doing 